the divine harmonies, which we might imagine as the harmony of the spheres, which are individual tones of the music scale and also the archetypal qualities in all things, are known to us in the music they make when they're woven together. We have to keep this distinction clear. There's the harmony, which is both the sounds from which things are made and the law which allows them to come together. And there is the music which they weave. We can focus our minds on the individual qualities and learn their natures. And like Ficino, learn how those qualities affect us, how we can draw on them to balance our souls, a touch of Venus or Mars, a meditation in the mode of Saturn. But when those tones weave music, we become aware of meaning, as if music is a language communicating meaning to our souls. And we remember that harmony is only one dimension of the divine in nature. This music seeks unity. The sense of meaning which music communicates is the sense of forms seeking unity or truth. We sense this work of formation as mystery. In Christian terms, we might say that every work of music or nature is an expression in infinite variety of the word. The composer learns this language of combination, of formation, just as an artist does. The artist learns that we experience the true nature of a colour when that colour appears in the right place, in the right context. Just as a composer learns that an individual harmony or melodic idea has meaning when it's placed in that particular moment. This, I hope, is easy for us to understand because we're all familiar with complex music in many styles and fashions that reflects the work of nature with light and shade, concord and discord. All musical traditions depend on the same laws of harmony. The expressive power of Northern Indian music, for example, depends on the subtle deviations from the natural harmonies, a linear, melodic and rhythmic complexity rather than a harmonic system. In the medieval world, as I've discussed in my talks on St. Francis and St. Bonaventure, the study of music tended to look to the heavens, to the divine harmonies and number. Worldly music tried to imitate the spheres. By the time of Francesco Giorgi in the Renaissance, the new polyphonic, multi-voiced music of Western Europe helped us understand that the three voices of the world, the spheres and the angels could sound together, each in their own way, but in harmony, because the three worlds all followed the same law. The Christian tradition emphasized the essential goodness of creation, that this changing world of light and shade, concord and discord could reveal God. And so the developing music could be understood as a model of creation, not just a metaphor for the language of creation, but a form of that language itself. Because the laws of harmony and the laws of formation guided by harmony and drawn by unity are the same laws. Creation is formed by the laws of number that form harmonious sounds. This is the tradition which I've been pursuing in all my talks for the Fintry Trust. My theme is music as the language of creation, the hidden music of nature. By the 17th century, this had become a lost wisdom. From the 13th century, the new Aristotelian philosophy detached God from creation and allowed nature to be seen as an object. 
the new astronomy of Copernicus and others showed that the ancient image of the cosmos was not physically real. Some new Reformation traditions turned away from nature, as theophany through which God communicated to all, to focus on scripture as the sole authority. They were the beginnings of the materialism, which still survives 500 years later. And yet, to anyone who understood that the ancient tradition was rooted in harmony itself, this cosmos and this music is still true. The ancient image of the cosmos is an image of the laws of harmony and not a literal depiction of the physical universe. But in this inhospitable new world, where did this tradition go? It was no longer understood or accepted in either Catholic or Protestant worlds. Who were its inheritors? Looking at Francesco Giorgi, I defined four key themes of his book De Harmonia Mundi and the Franciscan Musical Theology. Unity known in harmony, harmony in all creation and music as the language of creation, the importance of imagination and images, the optimistic view of the soul's ability to become attuned to God. These themes can be detected in Elizabethan England, which stood rather apart from both Catholic and Protestant Europe, and was a haven for Platonic philosophy and new scientific worldviews. But in the early 17th century, religious conflicts were developing, between those who wanted a return to a more Catholic style, enjoying images and music in worship, and the variety of degrees of Puritanism and Protestantism. It's important to point out that this is not a simple two-sided conflict. There were many alternative views. Not all Puritans disapproved of music, for example. In England, it was a century of conflict, but it was also a century in which many alternative religious and political ideas could develop and coexist. And so the answer to the question, where did the platonic musical theology that flowered with Francesco Giorgi go, seems to be very simple. Cambridge. Of course, this must be an oversimplification, but Cambridge University in the years before the English Civil War was the place where a revival in England of Platonism can clearly be seen in the very disparate group of thinkers known as the Cambridge Platonists. And among these, I think we can see the new shoots of that musical theology which flowed through Georgie. This isn't a provable thing. It might be that the same ideas happen to reappear in a conducive spot, but Georgie's book was available in the university library, and Cambridge did have a thriving musical life which was inquiring, philosophical and spiritual. How could these musical and searching students not have studied Georgie? Henry Moore, Ralph Cudworth, Nathaniel Culverwell, Benjamin Whichcott were all individually minded students of Plato, developing a largely tolerant and open view of Christianity known as latitudinarianism. Tom Dixon has shown that most of these Platonists were musicians. Beside Peter Sterry, the Cambridge Platonist who stands out for me is the sadly short-lived John Smith, 1618 to 1652, who entered Emmanuel College in 1636, the year in which Sterry became a fellow of the same college. Smith was a musician, his will mentions that he owned a set of vials. He's the most eloquent writer on the Christian life, but Smith also seems to be someone who had studied the Franciscan Bonaventure. Smith expresses the distinctly Franciscan view of nature as theophany in Franciscan language. 
This was not a common view in either Catholic or Protestant worlds in the first half of the 17th century. We can see here a Franciscan spirit that seems now peculiarly English, because something like this Platonic Franciscan vision re-emerges in other distinctly English writers, Isaac Walton's revolutionary appreciation of nature, and the writings of Thomas Traherne, who was an Oxford man, and also a Platonist, and reader of Ficino and the Hermetica. But here's John Smith. God made the universe, and all the creatures therein, as so many glasses in which he can reflect his own glory. He hath copied forth himself in the creation, and in this outward world we may read the lovely characters of the divine goodness, power and wisdom. In some creatures there are darker representations of God, there are the prints and footsteps of God, but in others there are clearer and fuller representations of the divinity, the face and image of God. And here's Bonaventure in his soul's journey into God. Concerning the mirror of things perceived through sensation, we can see God not only through them as through his vestiges, but also in them as he is in them by his essence, power and presence. Smith's glasses is a clear reflection of Bonaventure's mirrors. But Smith's use of the word footsteps, which is the literal meaning of Bonaventure's famous term vestiges, must be more than a coincidence. And here's Smith seeing the world as theophany. Thus many a good man may walk up and down in the world as in a garden of spices and suck a divine loveliness from every flower. There is a twofold meaning in every creature as the Jews speak of their law, a literal and a mystical, and the one is but the ground of the other. And seeing God hath never thrown the world from himself, but runs through all created essence, containing the archetypal ideas of all things in himself, a soul that is truly godlike, cannot but everywhere behold itself in the midst of that glorious unbounded being who is indivisibly everywhere. A good man finds every place he treads on holy ground. To him the world is God's temple. He is ready to say with Jacob, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God. This is a perfect definition of the kind of theology of creation that's associated with the early Franciscans. There are some critically important ideas here, that God hath never thrown the world from himself, but runs through all created essence. This is the idea of emanation. Everything pours out from God, and God is in that outpouring. Creation is never made or detached from God. And God contains the archetypal ideas of all things in himself. The forms or idea of things are within God's mind. But Smith knows how difficult it is to be what he calls here a good man. He writes, It is to be feared that our nice speculations about what concerns us in theology have tended more to exercise men's wits than to reform their lives. Though he was a musician, Smith rarely uses musical language, but he does write, When God restores men to a new and divine life, he doth not make them like so many dead instruments, stringing and fitting them, which yet are able to yield no sound of themselves, but he puts a living harmony within them. Perhaps it would be true to say that this theophanic vision, 
was inherited not by the Cambridge Platonists as such, they were, as I've said, a very mixed group, but by the musicians. Yes, I can't help thinking that this consistent, coherent and continuing religious movement is not to be attached to any of the usual categories of Christian tradition. It's a musical theology, beginning in the ancient past with the discovery of harmony, flowing through Pythagoras and Plato and the Hebrew temple, adopting new images in Christianity, adopted by the Franciscans, lost and then found in the work and thought of musicians from the Renaissance onwards. Musicians who study both the harmony of the spheres and the working of music in nature. I'm not saying that anyone was ever conscious of this, as if they were intentionally carrying forward a secret tradition, and yet they were. The music of this time is sacred scripture. The fantasies of Orlando Gibbons and William Laws are as much part of the spiritual treasure of the time as the poetry of Dunn, Herbert and Vaughan. It's really a historical accident that this hidden stream emerges in 17th century England. Western European music developed its expressive language in Italy in the late Renaissance, with the attempts to recreate the emotional effect of ancient Greek drama. At the same time as Monteverdi and others experimented with revolutionary opera and vocal music, a new style of instrumental music developed. Not just music for dancing or delight, but music with expressive power and meaning. Music which had its effect and value by being pure music, not because it was attached to words. This was something which the revered classical philosophical sources did not have the language to explain, and so we do not find philosophical discussions that explain the meaning of pure music even in the 18th century, as I'll show in my next talk. Instrumental music, as something with meaning and philosophical value, developed in two principal ways. In Italy and the Catholic countries, the most sophisticated works were solo violin sonatas with a harmonic accompaniment in the style invented to accompany operatic singing. There are outstanding works in the 17th century. The sonatas of Schmelzer and Bieber, his rosary or mystery sonatas, which explore every emotion of the Christian story. There are also keyboard works by Froberger, which seem to be intended to represent stories and ideas, perhaps not quite seriously. England was detached from the Catholic world and had no place for opera or elaborate sacred music. In some ways it was behind the times and was slow to adopt the new violin. English musicians did learn all the new resources of harmony and expression, but used them in different kinds of music. In England, the most sophisticated music of the early 17th century took the form of consort music. Music for groups of musicians, playing viols in private, even in secret, as if performing alchemical experiments. Tom Dixon has shown that there were close connections in Cambridge between music and a continuing tradition of alchemy throughout the 17th century. Some Cambridge musicians were also alchemists, both are ways of exploring the secrets of nature. Cambridge was full of music before the Civil War, theatrical, sacred, rowdy and private. But this is the philosophical music which occupied the Cambridge students and which provides the language for Peter Sterry's theology. This is music that explores nature in light and shade, concord and discord. Thomas Mace sang in the choir of Trinity College, Cambridge from 1635, when he was a contemporary at the University of Smith and Sterry. Thirty years later, when he felt music had become trivial, he remembered the private music of his youth. 
he lamented the loss of the old consort music, which was like so many pathetical stories, rhetorical and sublime discourses, subtle and acute argumentations. To Mace, music was a sacred language. In that music speaks so transcendentally and communicates its notions so intelligibly to the internal and incomprehensible faculties of the soul, so far beyond all language of words, that I confess and most solemnly affirm I have been more sensibly, fervently and zealously captivated and drawn into divine raptures and contemplations by those unexpressible, rhetorical, uncontrollable persuasions and instructions of music's divine language than ever yet I have been by the best verbal rhetoric that came from any man's mouth, either in pulpit or elsewhere. This, I hope, gives the context in which we can look at the writings of the most musical of the Cambridge Platonists, Peter Sterry, and his place in the story of this musical theology. After some very brief biographical comments, I'll allow Sterry to speak in his own words. Peter Sterry, 1613-1672, was born in Surrey. He studied at Emmanuel College from 1629 and became a fellow in 1635. But in 1637 he resigned his fellowship to become chaplain to Robert Greville, second Baron Brook. Lord Brooke was a radical parliamentarian and a philosopher. His 1640 book, The Nature of Truth, which might have been written with Sterry's help, argues for a tolerant Protestantism embracing alternative views and opposes the idea of an established church. By 1649 and the execution of King Charles I, Sterry was a private chaplain to Oliver Cromwell and on 16th of February 1649 became chaplain to the Council of State. After Cromwell's death in 1658, Sterry was seen as an overzealous supporter of Cromwell, even implying that the deceased Lord Protector would become a heavenly intercessor for England, preparing for the Second Coming. Perhaps surprisingly knowing this, Sterry received a pardon from Charles II at the Restoration in 1660. He became a chaplain to Philip Sidney Viscount Lyle and retired with his family to live in a community, a lovely society, he called it, on Lord Lyle's estate at West Sheen. This family community is a parallel with the earlier royalist Little Gidding community, Extraordinarily, for a short period, Sterry lived within walking distance up the River Thames from Thomas Traherne at Teddington, a clergyman on the other political side, but strangely similar in his ideas and literary style. The writings I'm quoting all come from Sterry's years at West Sheen, when he'd become a man of peace with extraordinarily tolerant attitudes. He sometimes called a Puritan, but he seems to be impossible to pigeonhole. Is he a Calvinist? His most important book is the posthumous A Discourse of the Freedom of the Will, the unlikely source for some of what follows. Belief in the freedom of the will is an important doctrine in Catholicism. Sterry, in theory, argues against such freedom but in a, to me, impenetrable way, suggesting that we do not have free will because we can only really do God's will, but God desires infinite variety. The title page of the 1675 publication of A Discourse of the Freedom of the Will has a motto from the letter to the Hebrews, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. The lengthy preface is a plea for toleration. 
Let no differences of principles or practices divide thee in thine affections from any person. Had my education, my acquaintance, the several circumstances and concurrences been the same to me as to this person, from whom I now most of all dissent, that which is now his sense and state might have been mine. This is the attitude of someone who had lived through years of civil war and religious dispute. A discourse of the freedom of the will was put together from unfinished material, which explains its difficulties. But the most important section for me is a study of the soul, as a commentary on a famous poem from the Constellation of Philosophy by the 6th century AD writer Boethius, one of the most read and most translated books in the Middle Ages, which helped keep Platonism alive for centuries. Boethius writes of the Creator ordering the world through harmony, but Sterry adds more allusions to music and dance. For example, Boethius's reason becomes reason's music. Here's the first part of Sterry's version of Boethius's hymn to the Creator. O thou who by the golden linked chain of reason's music with an even strain conductest all from thy bright throne on high, father of shady earth and shining sky. By undiscovered tracts, time's stream and spring, thou from eternity's vast sea dost bring. Motion and change, ever unknown to thee, from thee derived, and by thee guided be. This work of floating matter which we see, by inbred form of good from envy free, by sweetest force of native love's rich seeds, without external course from thee proceeds. In love's eternal garden, as its flowers flourish in their first forms and fullest powers all beauties. These are the life, the living law, from which thou dost all forms of being draw. As light to dazzled eyes, all things below from these pure suns in fading circles flow. A world all fair, from thee supremely fair, shines in thy mind, above control or care. In an harmonious image, Thou the same, by perfect parts, dost to perfection frame. By potent charms of sacred numbers bound, the waving elements keep their set round. Fire, air, earth, water, in mysterious dances, move to thy music through all times and chances. The original poem is a key text of the musical theology and Boethius's insistence on the goodness of creation is echoed in Franciscan thinking, as was Boethius's belief that love was the energy of creation. But to Sterry, reason is itself music. Harmony is the guiding law, but the world is free, moving to the divine music, but subject to chance. What does Sterry tell us about the soul in his commentary on Boethius? The human soul we know from Plato's Timaeus is a microcosm of creation. It mysteriously contains everything, and as Francesco Giorgi explained, it embraces the material, celestial and angelic worlds. Boethius wrote, the threefold nature's golden knot mid-band, the soul thou tiest in one by love's bright hand. Sterry explains that the three natures are manifestly the invisible, 
incorporeal nature, immortal spirits. The visible, corporeal nature, bodies, mortal or immortal. The soul, the middle between both these. The soul is a middle nature between both these, not by abnegation or separation, but by participation and connection, the golden knot tying all in one. Sterry explains that the soul extendeth herself through both natures to their utmost heights above and depth beneath by her idea, which is her golden head, by her angel. Thus Plotinus believed the soul herself in her essence, in her intellectual form, to be her own good angel. The soul springs forth by a continual emanation, a continual irradiation or process from the divine mind. The soul has the form the prophet Isaiah saw of a six-winged seraph. This reminds me of Bonaventure's vision of the seraph at Laverna, which gave him the form for the soul's journey into God. The wings are the images of things springing up within them, a form, Sterry says, of angel magic. The two lowest wings are the images of all corporeal natures. The divine unity is alone a true and perfect unity, substantial, supreme, unbounded. This hath a perfect, unbounded variety in it, with an uniformity. All forms of things here, as they are most perfectly distinct by the perfection of the variety, so are they most perfectly one by the perfection of the unity. This is the divine world, containing innumerable divine worlds in itself. The soul, being the first seat of motion and time, is also the first seat of music, which is a motion measured by time and by the order of ascents and descents. It is therefore defined by harmony. The soul in its unity diffuseth itself through all its particular forms and motions, dwelleth as an hidden seed of harmony in each of them, figureth itself upon each particular and upon the whole, uniteth and bindeth up all by itself into one entire peace, into one universal harmony, which includes all particular harmonies, all sorts of music in itself. This is a music sounding through all, where each various form, the obscurest, the most minute, is a string upon the golden lute of the whole image of things, each motion a touch of the chief, the invisible musician, the spirit of the whole, the spirit of unity and harmony, each touch a part of the music, exactly answering in all musical proportions to every other part and to the whole, making perfect the divine consort, in which all the angels, all the ideal and first glories in the divine mind, bear a part with every worm and dust on the earth, every wave and drop in the sea, every dragon and owl in the desert, every flake of snow in the air. There is a divine mystery here. There's the soul and there is our soul. The two are both one and individual. We have the divine world in us. In more informal language, Sterry wrote to his son, Let us ever remember that we are here in our pilgrimage and disguise. Let us have our own country and the way to it ever in our hearts. I know nothing pleasanter than that which David sung to God. 
Thy statutes are my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. Even in this earthly body, the manifestations of the love and beauty are songs, harmony, music made by the heavenly spheres of the divine beings themselves in us, by the charms of which even our house, our pilgrimage, and all things in it are turned into heavenly dances and delights. We have the harmonies of the spheres in our souls. I think there's an echo of Ficino's commentary on Plato's Symposium here. And this lets us see our earthly pilgrimage as the divine world. Unlike Bunyan, the Calvinist Baptist, imagining a pilgrim's progress from this world to the next, Sterry can see this world as heavenly dances and delights. Creation is the mask of love. Every individual thing, as Bonaventure and long before Proclus would have said, is in itself a divine unity because it's an expression of the word or the one original idea in the mind of God. The idea in this sense is the first and distinct image of each form of things in the divine mind. Every idea of each creature is this idea, bringing forth itself according to the inestimable treasures of the Godhead in it, into innumerable distinct figures of itself in the unconfined varieties of its own excellencies and beauties, so that it may enjoy itself, sport with itself in these with endless and ever new pleasures of all divine loves. Each thing is a reflection of the word in endless variety, so the word dances or sports with itself, combining, separating, endlessly forming new works. The world is a sacred performance, a mask of love. The whole court of heaven is there too secretly in disguise. Nay, these disguises, strange lands, forests, woods, tempests, nights, mistakes and disorders are the angels, the glorious ministers of divine love, casting themselves into these shapes like princes and princesses in a mask. All this is a divine play composed and acted by themselves in the riches of their own divine spirit the unity and centre of all spirits, of all varieties, of all wisdom, power and love, to enlarge and heighten their mutual delights and loves. The spirit hideth itself in them all, in every point of the roughness, in every spot of the darkness, with a full consort of heavenly music, the music of heaven with a mixed dance of divine beauties and loves to quicken, soften, enlighten, sweeten all. Suppose this first and supreme harmony by the divine force of the heavenly music casting itself into the figure of a glorious man playing upon a golden lute, whose delicious sounds form themselves into rocks, rivers, woods and caves beneath, and at a distance which at once echo and dance to the melody, while the supreme harmony itself springeth and soundeth with its golden notes all around about the scene and through every part of it. This representeth the chief musician, Jesus Christ, as he is before and above this creation, the mediator uniting all things created and uncreated, standing between both states in the glory composed of both, and comprehending both in a heavenly marriage one to the other, and yet distinct from both. 
The idea of Christ the musician wasn't new. Clement of Alexandria in the second century AD wrote of Christ the conductor leading the new song. The music of this world is, like the consort music played by the students in Cambridge, composed of concord and discord, and yet is also a theophany. Every single note in this sacred music is a particular and singular form in the divine works. These single notes are contrary to another, are distinguished into flats and sharps, concords and discords, like to the dancing of witches or howlings of devils. The divine harmony reconciles and marries them into answering and suitable notes. Thus they become the sweetest relishes of the music, most necessary and delightful parts of it, which bear the universal harmony itself as a pearl seed in their bosoms and a crown of diamonds upon their heads. We might think a Puritan would be someone who would disapprove of works of imagination and images as a whole, but Sterry is clearly not what we might think a Puritan should be. Someone with such a strong platonic way of thinking must have known the importance of images for our understanding of the divine world. His theology is full of the idea of images, of the works of God being images in the soul. Some Puritans, only some, went about destroying images in churches. The imagery of the medieval Catholic world was lost to them. But we crave images as we crave music, as ways the higher truths can be communicated to the soul. The world is a mask. A mask might communicate the divine world. Sterry was fascinated by the French romance Astray by Honoré d'Urfé, a vast romance of imaginary shepherds and druids. But unlike its predecessor, Sydney's Arcadia, it's set in the real landscape of the Haute Loire, in places its author loved. This is a mysterious and wonderful thing, placing imagination in a real landscape. Sterry is credited with writing the first English poem inspired by Druids. But the Druids of Durfey's romance are Christian Platonists who tell us that their deities are other names for aspects of one god. In his introduction to his poem, which was unpublished and unknown until 1994, Sterry gives the most wonderful description of how this world is a theophany. All these honours put upon fields, woods and trees seem to be a commemoration of paradise with a secret, sacred and sweet impression of it on the minds of men, arising from the holy story spread obscurely and confusedly from the beginning of the world through the nations, or from that sympathy which seems to be in nature between a divine state of things and the fields or groves. For so we generally find the nativeness, the springing life, the freshness and flourishing luster, the solemnity, the quiet, the purity, the sweetness, the liberty, the pleasures, the mixtures of light and shade, the openness of the light, the depth of the shade, the murmurings of winds, the clearness, the course of rivers, all conspire together to awaken in the soul a certain sense and image of an immortal and divine state, and to raise the soul to desiring it and aspiring to it. The mixtures of light and shade could be a description of landscapes by Gainsborough a hundred years later. It's almost incredibly English in its emphasis on light, shade and weather, but it's directly inspired by the setting of Durfey's romance, set in the hills above the Loire. Sterry's poem, which follows, is a dialogue between the druid Adamas, representing Sterry, and the nymph Amasis, 
Stowe's wife. It is, in fact, a specifically Christian poem, beginning with the pair lamenting the fall, the loss of Eden. It's spiritual friendship which unites the pair and takes them to a new paradise. Friendship's great soul in Amasis, encircling her loved Adamas, with charms divine so works. He is nor what nor where before he was. Ten thousand loves, ten thousand graces, sprung up in that immortal nest. Into new forms, into new places, transport my soul within the breast. Angels' abodes, a flowery plain, gardens of soft, perfumed air, above all clouds, all winds and rain, where all things flourish sweet and fair. Delicious shades, perpetual spring, where beauty's queen crowns her own roses, turtles on every myrtle sing, each thing a deity discloses. Music through all things here doth fly on angels' wings with sacred sounds. The inspired earth with heaven's high dance to it in immortal rounds. My soul, embosomed in thine, doth there make these discoveries. O blessed land, O soul divine, in which this land of glory lies. The poem reaches an extraordinary climax in which they find that in love they are at the centre of the world. All places are one. All the various scenes of place, with every sweet, endearing grace, at once presented to our sights in one clear spirit full of lights. Sweet point, where time stands still in sight, dear centre, which doth place unite. This, this to me, Adamus is, this, this to me is Amasis. The highest unity entire, rich varieties full choir, a paradise's solitude, enclosing all things fair and good, my soul's sweet rest, my senses feast, my dear heart's secret, sacred rest. Love brings the lovers to a paradise in West Sheen by the River Thames, perhaps. Is love all we need for redemption? This isn't what we would expect from Oliver Cromwell's chaplain. Peter Sterry gives us the clearest and most direct explanation of the musical theology which I've been tracing from the early 13th century. Sterry is Trinitarian, and this is where this musical theology becomes distinctly Christian rather than purely Platonic, though there are parallels in Platonism. God is the source, a Platonic idea of God as unity, from which everything flows in an outpouring of love. The word is unity within everything, in infinite variety, and the spirit unites all things. Harmony for Sterry is a real, essential part of creation, the law in all things which guides creation. The soul is a reflection of the soul of the world. It contains all things, or potentially contains all things. Sterry's music is real music, and this, I think, is the most important aspect of his thought. Creation can reveal God, even in the discords, the dragon, owl or snowflake. We're not concerned with looking up at the pure harmonies of the spheres, but at the music of creation, of which our own music is a part. If we're in harmony with the spheres, we can hear the music of earth and know God in everything. 
in the varied works which make the single whole. This seems real to me. It's what the world's like. It's a way of understanding the mystery in things around us and within us. There are many implications to this. Sterry is sure that God desires variety in everything, including the church. If God is unity, truth must be true for everyone and everything. God is inclusive. Another implication is that it does seem that Sterry is the inheritor of this musical theology. His God and his cosmos are the God and cosmos of Francis and Bonaventure, which had been lost under the weight of new theology and new scientific ideas. What does this mean for us? The musical theology is a way of thinking about God's presence in creation. But how do we become attuned to the divine harmony? We are not generally able to share in the mask of love. This is where religious practice comes in, which is a different question. And yet, the Christian mysteries, the sacraments, seem to have origins in the same mysterious past as the knowledge of harmony. But I'll end by saying again that it does seem that this musical theology is lost to the church, either Catholic or Protestant, but survives in the care of certain musicians, perhaps very few who actually think about it, but in far more who carry on writing and performing, and knowing that this is what the world is like, regardless of words and theology.